Welcome to the 54th Interscience Conference on Antimicrobial Agents and Chemotherapy, or ICAC, and this is ASM Live. Welcome, I'm Michael Schmidt from This Week in Microbiology, and together with the program committee, together we have selected some of this week's science to present to you. We're very fortunate this morning to have two of the authors who will be presenting work here at the meeting on a new and exciting topic. Um, I encourage you to participate in our session here this morning, and should you have any questions, please use the microphone. And those of you in the Twitterverse or our live chat room, please post your questions, and we'll take them and answer them. So this morning, the, it's as many of you know, we're approaching that time of the year in the United States where we begin to hear it's time for our annual flu shot. We all know that everyone from the age of infants to the elderly need to get this annual vaccination. However, we know that the flu is a very clever virus and occasionally it changes its spots such that the vaccine no longer is as effective as when it was designed. Here's where our topic this morning will come into play. We're going to learn about a new single-dose influenza drug. Analysis from a phase three and phase two clinical trial shows that a single injected dose of this new neuraminidase inhibitor, uh, paramethir, is safe and effective in alleviating influenza symptoms, including fever, and most importantly, from my selfish perspective, viral shedding, when administered within 48 hours of the onset of symptoms. These two researchers uh, on my left, we have Dr. Rich Whiteley from the University of Alabama at Birmingham, affectionately referred to as UAB, and Dr. Bill Sheridan from BioCrist. And uh, gentlemen, you're going to share with us this new and exciting uh, data that you have been able to generate. And one of the things I do for my normal day job is I teach medical students. And one of the things they have trouble recognizing is the significance of influenza. And so I always ask them, what is lethargy? We've all heard the term lethargy, but they really have no appreciation. And lethargy, as many of us know, is one of the principal symptoms of influenza. So the way I bring it home to them, the 20-something audience, is I say, lethargy has truly a clinical definition of too tired to text. So gentlemen, tell us your story. Okay, well, why don't I begin? Um, influenza, as everyone in the room knows, is associated with significant mortality and significant morbidity. In the United States alone, we see about a quarter of a million people hospitalized and somewhere around 25 to 30,000, maybe even 35,000 people die as a consequence of influenza. What's absolutely fascinating about this disease is that it selects out different populations to cause morbidity and mortality. So historically, we would have said, well, the disease only afflicts the very elderly, leading to complications like pneumonia and complications from underlying cardiovascular disease, or the very young, and namely children under a year of age. But what we learned during the 2009 H1N1 pandemic was we saw young people suffer the brunt of the illness along with pregnant women and individuals with neurologic debility. So why do I bring that up? I bring it up for one fundamental reason. We can't ignore influenza. Influenza is here to stay. We can't ignore it. We need to get immunized for it every year on an annual basis. If we don't get immunized and we get influ influenza or if we get immunized and we still get influenza, we need to have antiviral drugs available for the purposes of therapy. And the goal is to keep people out of the hospital and to keep people from dying. And I worry about it again in the very elderly, the very young, and then in high-risk populations that we identify epidemiologically. Well, so what's the difference between this phase two and phase three clinical trial? Many of us here at this meeting are well familiar with trial jargon, but to those out there watching us this morning, What's actually the difference between phase two and phase three? What do you try to learn? Or is it the same question that you're asking in both studies? Bill, is that a question for you? Uh, why don't I take a, a first crack at it? So in drug development, um, you go through stages. And the first stage is to test the safety of a new drug and to make sure that 
the levels of the drug that you get in the blood are what you're hoping for. And uh, that's often done with new drugs in healthy people first before you then put the drug into people with a disease. So in this case, in influenza studies, um, you go from what's called phase one into studies in influenza patients in uh, two steps. And the first step is to uh, make sure that you're getting an effect of the drug and to measure how big that effect is. So that's what we do in phase two. And a uh, phase three trial is simply a bigger version of a phase two trial done exactly the same way to confirm in a definitive way uh, that the drug works. Do you want to add anything to that, Rich? No, the only thing that I would add is usually our Food and Drug Administration requires two phase three studies for registration, but sometimes they don't. And when they don't, it's a disease of major importance. And usually what happens beyond phase two, phase three studies is we have what are known as phase four studies, and that's designed to collect safety information in the real world to make sure that the parameters and efficacy defined in a phase three study are upheld in a phase four study. So one of the things I remember about the pandemic is the messaging that was associated with administering the then neuraminidase inhibitor, uh, oseltamivir. It was very important to take it within 48 hours of onset of symptoms. Can you explain why it's so critical to take these neuraminidase inhibitors at this particular window? Yeah, I mean, it's what we've learned from experience. The earlier you treat, the better a patient's going to do. And as many of you in the room know, a lot of the symptoms that are associated with influenza are mediated by cytokines. And so if the virus has a chance to replicate for longer periods of time, the probability of inducing cytokine responses is far greater. There was a beautiful study that was done by Steve Strauss and Fred Hayden at the National Institutes of Health where they took patients and they challenged them with a flu strain and either treated them with a neuraminidase inhibitor or a placebo, and then they measured cytokine responses. And you could see a direct correlation between the time that the uh, neuraminidase inhibitor was started and the ablation of the cytokine response. So our goal is, is to make patients feel better. Um, probably the best example I can give you is my daughter-in-law. She came to me on a Tuesday afternoon about one o'clock said, I'm horribly lethargic, I have fever, I have a cough, and I've got to take my qualifying exams for my PhD tomorrow morning at eight o'clock in the morning. And I said, well, let's go find out if you have flu. So I took her to the laboratory and we did a rapid flu test, and sure enough, it was positive. And I put her on a neuraminidase inhibitor. She felt well enough by that evening that she was able to study and take her, uh, her qualifying exams the next morning. So if you start early, the drug's gonna have an effect. If you question the value of neuraminidase inhibitors and wait until the patient gets really sick and tries to die on you, it's going to be well past 48 or 72 hours. And therapy at that point in time is going to have very, very little value. And, and so we go back to um, when to use this drug. And back during the last pandemic, we heard a lot of talk about the importance of using these antivirals in situations where individuals may be together, like long-term care health facilities or uh, nursing home facilities or rehab centers. And if one person would go down with flu, how it was very important to um, deliver these neuraminidase inhibitors to others that may be coincidentally exposed. Would you like to say why that's the case? Yeah, let me just begin by setting the stage with where we stand with vaccines. And it would be no surprise to anyone here that the efficacy of influenza vaccines is much less in elderly people. We don't get the same immunogenic response as we would with the people who are in this room who are a lot younger. And therefore, the elderly remain at risk for developing life-threatening influenza. So if a case of influenza appears in a nursing home or a care facility, it would be perfectly reasonable to in administer what we call post-exposure prophylaxis to everyone else in the facility. And that's become a very effective way of controlling influenza. Those studies were done in the late 1990s and early 2000s for both of the licensed uh, neuraminidase inhibitors, and we use it pretty routinely now. And I'll go one step further, Michael, and that is if you're a family member and you come home 
and someone in the family has influenza, there's no reason why you can't administer post-exposure prophylaxis to everyone in the family. Someone in the family has cancer, but they were immunized, yet one of the children in the family comes home with influenza. You want to protect the person who's on chemotherapy because they're at risk for severe disease, even though they were immunized. I think that's you know, one of the major drivers. So, Bill, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. Why develop a new drug? Is it, why do we need a new drug? So the gap that we saw was that there was no parenteral or in other words, intravenous or intramuscular uh, form of a drug. Uh, so the two drugs that Rich mentioned are given by mouth or uh, by inhalation. And uh, you know, sometimes people with influenza are vomiting as part of the illness, and they're not going to keep down a course of uh, neuraminidase inhibitor given by mouth. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult, especially in the younger folks uh, to, or, and in the elderly, to take a drug by inhalation and get it into the lungs. Uh, so there is a need for an alternative route of administration of a neuraminidase inhibitor. And uh, we were in the fortunate situation of having paramivir, uh, which is easy to formulate in solution and easy to give uh, both IM and IV, and we've done studies both ways. I think one of the exciting things about your paper that you're going to present is the fact that it's a single dose. Mm -hmm. So share with us how you worked out that you only needed one shot. Um, so it would be great to tell you a scientific story about uh, how clever we were in designing the drug so that it would work that way. But the reality is if you have a, an intravenous drug or a shot and you have somebody with influenza who's an outpatient, you're not going to be able to give the drug more than once you know, you know, using that type of yeah. approach because the patient will go home. So then what do you do? So I think that in reality, uh, we were, um, by practical necessity, uh, forced into developing the drug and to finding out whether it would work as a single dose, and fortunately it did. So let me ask the next question um, that my mother would ask me. When do you need to go to your physician's office to say, I think I have flu, I need this magic shot? You know, how, how does the average person gauge that? Or they should just go when they have the frank symptoms of flu? Well, I think that's a great question. Um, flu occurs at a time when we see other respiratory virus infections. And I want to come back to that because a that's lot of a good people point too. who get immunized say, oh, I got influenza and I was immunized. But let's come back to that in a minute. I think what um, our local health departments are doing that's really terrific is they're trying to educate everybody in the community about influenza being present and to give uh, individuals in the community some sense as to when they need to seek medical care. So for example, in the city of Birmingham, we have a newsletter that goes to all of our physicians, irrespective of specialty of training. And then in the newspaper and on the radio and television shows, we make sure everyone knows that influenza is there. We do a campaign in the fall to get everybody immunized. Um, we do a campaign in the hospital, and we can talk more about that later if you want, Michael. But I think the really important thing is the community has to be educated. I want to make one other point uh, to add on to what Bill said, and that is some of us practice medicine in underserved communities. So if you see the patient once, you're lucky. And if you give them a prescription for something, and you expect them to get it filled, the probability of it happening, happening is maybe 20 to 25 percent. So if you're worried about that individual, you have to have an alternative mechanism of delivering a medication. And so direct observed therapy in the, in the healthcare provider's office, whether it's a nurse or a physician, it doesn't matter, is a good way to help solve this problem. Can I go back to the vaccine issue and then... Well, I was just going to follow up. Go so this, this drug from a public health perspective sounds even better than the oral medication because it requires me, the end user, to get in my car, drive to the drugstore, get the prescription filled if they have it, then have the presence of mind to go back into my car, drive home, and then take the full course of the medication. Oh, you hit the nail on the head. In Birmingham during the flu season last year, um, my, my children's family 
um, to get enough uh, neuraminidase inhibitor to treat the family, they had to go to three different pharmacies to get the drug. So, you know, that just doesn't work from a healthcare delivery perspective. I mean, these people had the wherewithal to be able to do it, but a lot of people would just say, oh, this isn't worth it, we're not going to do it. So from a public health perspective, you'd really want to arm the urgent care centers with this medication so the, at the point of care, they'll have the meds on board, be able to administer it, uh, when that patient presents with these symptoms. You'd <clears throat> want to have an active campaign so at the same time we don't misappropriately use this new med that we have flu tests on hand so we know that they have influenza before we administer this med. So I'd reiterate it and I would just say frontline healthcare providers should have the availability of the medication so that they can treat patients in the office and not worry about filling prescriptions. It's just That's that simple. And it sounds like good medicine. <clears throat> it is good medicine. So now back to your other point that you wanted okay, to make. Okay, so I want everybody to understand. If you get immunized with flu and you tell me that you developed influenza, I'm going to shoot you, personally. <laughs> I'm personally going to shoot you because you didn't develop influenza. What you probably did was develop the circulating respiratory virus infection that occurs at the same time that influenza does. And so as we study more and more respiratory virus diseases, and Fred Hayden, who's going to be speaking here on Tuesday morning, is the master of this. Uh, he's found that we've, we identify circulating rhinovirus infections, parainfluenza, and now, even more importantly, respiratory syncytial virus infections in adults. And RSV, the scourge of the pediatric the, office. Right, the scourge of people like me who are pediatricians who take care of little babies. But the bottom line on it is, is you just have to know that there will be other circulating viral infections and you didn't get the vaccine or you didn't get flu because you got the vaccine. The vaccine that adults, for the most part, get is inactivated. And even if you get the live attenuated vaccine, all you'll do is develop cold-like symptoms. And more importantly, if you get the live attenuated, you'll actually charitably inoculate the other members of your family. True. Which is actually, charity always begins at home. So that's, that's why I love live attenuated vaccines. We have a question from the audience. I'm puzzled why you would think that a family would, um, a family, parents and two children, for example, would go to a doctor's office when one person could go to the pharmacy, even if it's three pharmacies, that's a whole lot easier than taking four people, getting an appointment and going to a doctor's office for injections. So, so I, do, I don't mean to imply that all four people have to go to the physician's office. I think if a patient comes into a physician's office and the patient has influenza, an option for that physician is to treat the patient in the office with an intramuscular medication. On the other hand, if you're worried about family disease, what I would do is use a neuraminidase inhibitor that can be given easily to all members of the family. What I was trying to say was in underserved medical communities, the probability of being able to do post-exposure prophylaxis in a lower socioeconomic family on a scale of zero to 10 is zero. And I think that's one of the subtleties of the neuraminidase inhibitors. It actually will lower the concentration of virus that the individuals are shedding by simply locking the virus in the cells that are presently infected. Bill, do you want to comment on the mechanism of neuraminidase inhibitors or do you have a follow-up? I have a follow-up. All right. So. It's, I can see the use in a nursing home, but right now, what is the practice? So if one patient develops a flu in a nursing home, then do they use um, the oral or inhaled neuraminidase inhibitors for the rest of the population there? So CDC recommendations are use a neuraminidase inhibitor, and it allows a nursing home to pick and choose which one they want to use. I don't think you're going to find every nursing home doing post-exposure prophylaxis in the nursing home. So there is a degree of variability, and it is dependent upon state rules. Uh, but CDC would recommend post-exposure prophylaxis for the residents of those nursing homes. And in, ter and in terms of cost, is this, is this going to be comparable in cost if it's an injection? Is this going to be more expensive than the oral and inhaled? So we haven't determined pricing yet. Uh, in general, and maybe Rich can comment on this, uh, intravenous medicines tend to be more expensive than oral medicines. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't have any other comment to make on cost. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what the cost of paramivir is going to be, and all I can say is the cost of the other two neuraminidase inhibitors is falling as they go off patent. 
which is always the case. But I think neuraminidase inhibitors in general for influenza because of the life cycle, the vi life cycle of the virus are a very curious way to limit the spread of the virus. And Bill, would you like to comment on the mechanism? Well, sure. So uh, the term neuraminidase is an enzymology term and it's part of the machinery of the virus uh, that it uses to free itself when it buds from the cell membrane. So viruses are very clever organisms uh, that take over the cellular machinery to replicate themselves. They make thousands of copies and they, uh, in the case of enveloped viruses like influenza, they bud from the plasma membrane of the cell and uh, they have to get clipped off somehow. So influenza, in the case of influenza, the enzyme neuraminidase cleaves the sialic acid residue from the glycoproteins on the cell membrane to do that. Um, you can show in cell culture studies uh, that the direct mechanism of action uh, when you <coughs> inhibit that enzyme with a neuraminidase inhibitor, and this can be done with any of the neuraminidase inhibitors, is that you'll stop that process. So uh, you can measure the amount of uh, viral particles uh, that are released into the supernate, into the culture medium, for example. And you can show that that's uh, dramatically reduced. And then in animals and in people, uh, you can actually measure viral shedding from uh, respiratory epithelial surfaces, like the nasopharynx, for example. Uh, so in the influenza studies, uh, in all cases, uh, uh, we want to know what's the viral burden. So you measure that before and after. Periodically, you take specimens and uh, uh, you measure the amount of virus in a couple different ways and you can show that viral shedding, the proportion of patients who shed virus if they're getting a neuraminidase inhibitor including paramivir is lower than if you're getting a placebo. We have another question from the audience. Sure, uh, Michael Smith, MedPage Today. This is a, a nice general discussion of neuraminidase, inhib neuraminidase inhibitors and their use. I wonder if you could walk through the data in the studies that you're presenting. Gentlemen, why yeah, why don't I take a great question? Yeah, you know, and, and uh, I think that's really important. So starting therapy within 48 hours of the onset of disease, we can accelerate the resolution of symptoms, respiratory symptoms, by about 22 and a half, 23 hours, and resolution of fever by a little bit over a day. And if you ask me to put that into perspective with the other neuraminidase inhibitors, it's virtually identical for uh, oseltamivir or for, for zinamivir. So we see similar levels of benefit for all of them. With the paramivir studies, the shedding of virus was done with a little bit more detail than with the earlier registrational studies for the other two neuraminidase inhibitors. And what we see is statistically significant differences in viral shedding uh, for the first 48 to 72 hours compared to placebo. And then placebo recipients and treated recipients all tail off at about the same rate thereafter. So the point that Michael was making, decreasing viral shedding early is important because it decreases the probability of person-to-person -person transmission. And that has to be said in the context of uh, the absence of side effects, which is one of the benefits of a drug like paramivir. Uh, you know, with zinamivir, uh, Bill alluded to it, you can't give it to patients who have underlying respiratory illnesses like COPD or asthma because you will exacerbate underlying pulmonary conditions. And for oseltamivir, the GI side effects are greater than would be anticipated with placebo. Another question. Okay, a placebo-controlled study of how many patients um, and uh, were these all patients with confirmed lab-confirmed influenza? Um, and can we just quantify a little bit more about it? Sure, sure. So what this basically is, is uh, combining a phase two and a phase three study. And it was 427 patients. And the entry criteria was being otherwise healthy, greater than 18 years of age, and having confirmed, and I want to emphasize confirmed influenza, by a rapid antigen detection test. And that's important when you compare it with the other influenza studies that were done where they took everybody with symptoms and then retrospectively analyzed only those uh, who had influenza. Um, these are patients who didn't have underlying diseases um, and excluded patients who were immunocompromised. And if you want to talk about the specifics of the analysis, it would be basically what we call a patient-by-patient meta-analysis.
The study designs and the data collection tools were identical. The only difference was in one of the studies, the randomization was 300 milligrams, 150 milligrams, and placebo. And in the other study, it was 300 milligrams versus placebo. Is it so and it's the 300 milligram, I'm sorry, I just was going to add one other statement. It's the 300 milligram uh, data that are, in the opinion of many of us, the most efficacious dose to use. And so the phase two was the, was the two doses? Yes, that's right. correct. And so you've moved, moved, moved forward with the 300? That's correct, for the oh. reason that Bill mentioned before. Okay. And then the, the follow-up question is, is this enough to go forward with the registration, or are you going to have to do more studies? I'm going to let Bill address that. Sure. Um, so the, uh, the short answer is we've submitted a registration application to the FDA, and that was submitted uh, last year. Uh, there's uh, a, a terminology called PDUFA, which is the Physician Drug User Fee Act, and the, uh, that sets a, d a date that the FDA has to render their opinion by. Uh, so the date uh, that the FDA told us for this application is December the 23rd. So we'll know by then uh, about the FDA's review of the drug, and uh, you know, we're, of course, hopeful that the drug will get approved. Um, you know, in order to submit an application for a new drug, uh, to a regulatory agency, uh, you need to understand is the data sufficient, otherwise you're wasting a lot of people's time and effort in terms of reviewing the file. Uh, so as part of that process, uh, uh, sponsors like Biochrist and other drug manufacturers meet with the FDA, uh, tell them what their plan is and get guidance as to uh, whether this is a satisfactory body of evidence to submit. So all of that was, was done uh, before we submitted the file. I want to add one other point that's very, very important for this discussion, and that is this particular medication is already licensed in Japan and Korea, and it was licensed in approximately two, two, uh, 2010. And so we know that many, many patients have been exposed to the medication and have derived benefit from the literally the phase four data that we talked about before. But much of that, those data have to be a component of this filing for the purposes of our regulatory agencies. Thank you. So what is the p-value in the phase three trial? So why don't I take that? So um, there have been uh, three studies that are important for the indication of treatment of acute uncomplicated influenza in adults, and that's the indication we're seeking. Uh, one of those studies was done in Japan. Uh, that was uh, technically a phase two study, and uh, it was done with intravenous paramivir, and it had 100 patients per arm and three arms for a total of 300 patients, and it had a highly significant p-value. If memory serves me correctly, the value was 0 0.0046. And, uh, I'm sorry, 0. 0.0046. Okay. So that was the, that's viewed as the pivotal, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled experiment that supports the application for Paramivir in the United States. Uh, I'm sorry, you're that, saying a phase two trial is your pivotal trial for the U.S.? That's correct. That's correct. That's unusual, but that is in fact correct for the Paramivir filing. Um, so what counts is not the phase. What counts is whether it's adequate and well-controlled. And that's a judgment on the, uh, in the, uh, on the, that the regulators make. So having randomization to control for bias and having a placebo control so that you have a, uh, a gold standard uh, to compare your drug against sets the stage for having, um, uh, in the case of influenza in uncomplicated uh, influenza in an outpatient setting, that sets the stage for adequate and well-controlled. Uh, so that's the pivotal trial. Uh, the studies that Rich will be presenting on Monday um, were two studies done by Biochrist in uh, the US and other Western countries, so a different, different demographic, um, uh, same disease, uncomplicated influenza in the outpatient setting, and uh, the analysis is a combined patient level meta-analysis. What that means is that we've got access to all of the patient level data, and we pooled that data because the studies were essentially identically designed with identical endpoints, identical measures, identical follow-up, and we've combined that data to be the supportive data for the pivotal trial that I mentioned already. So depending on how you do the analysis, we have a p-value slightly over 0.05 or a bit under 0.05 for the primary endpoint and p-values that are all in the right direction below 0.05 for the secondary endpoints in this supportive analysis. 
So what you're saying is in the supportive, the p-values are less than 0 0.05. So uh, uh, to be crystal clear, uh, in a, uh, the primary endpoint in uncomplicated flu studies is time to alleviation of symptoms, which is a patient reported outcome, uh, which you follow every day. The patient fills out a diary. They uh, score all of their symptoms. And in order to count as recovered, uh, you have to improve on all of those symptoms to pretty, pretty much back to normal. Uh, to simplify it a little bit. So you measure the time it takes from when the patient gets randomized to when they're better using that patient reported outcome. That's the primary endpoint. Time to alleviation of fever, resolution of fever is one of the key secondary endpoints. So for the primary endpoint in the pivotal trial, it was the p-value that I mentioned before, which was about you know five in a thousand. Uh, for the current analysis that we're talking about today, if you do an unadjusted analysis, the p-value is less than 0.05. If you do an adjusted analysis that takes into account the factors in the randomization process where we stratify for things like smoking status and so on, you know, uh, then uh, it was slightly above 0.05. Uh, that's not the key issue that we're talking about today. The key issue is that um, uh, the combined analysis supports the pivotal trial results because everything is in the same direction and uh, it's a different demographic which is important because from a regulator's perspective um, you want to make sure that the uh, benefits from the drug are not exclusively in one ethnic population. Do you want to add anything? No. Okay. And the Japanese trial was Japanese patients? That's correct. Another question from the audience. Yeah, Dr. James McKinnell from David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA and former Alabama fellow. So good to see you, Dr. Whitley. <laughs> I know. Um, I want to ask your opinion actually on the dose that you used of 300 milligrams and the potential role you had for immunocompromised patients. I know these are immunocompetent patients, but as infectious disease specialists, we get the, the toughest of the tough. So That's a great question. What's your Across thoughts the there on immunocompromised there? So let me take the dose and then... Uh, then I'm going to flip yeah. to the others. Yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> so, uh, for Paramivir, we've actually studied a wide range of doses during the development program. And uh, you heard today already uh, that the studies that we'll be talking about on Monday were done with 150 milligrams as a single dose and 300 milligrams as a single dose. Um, in other studies, uh, we've studied 600 milligrams as a single dose. And we've also studied 600 milligrams in the hospital setting um, uh, given every day for five days or 10 days. And you know, this was a drug that was um, uh, taken up um, during the uh, pandemic uh, as uh, a drug that was approved temporarily under what's called an emergency use authorization. Um, so in part of the process of putting together an application for a new drug is you look at all of the data on dose. And you look at all of the safety data, you look at the pharmacokinetics, you look at the efficacy, and uh, you look at, uh, you know, scientifically what's called population pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic modeling to estimate um, where the dose response curve is with regard to the benefits that the patients are getting from the drug. And at the same time, you look at is there any evidence that there are any safety issues that you collect as you increase the dose. So uh, we put together all of those analyses for the agency and our conclusion was that there were no safety issues that were related to dose. We couldn't see any dose effect on safety issues. In fact, we can't see uh, an adverse event profile that's different from the placebo control in any of our studies. Um, so with that knowledge, uh, you then look at the PKPD relationship. And for most antimicrobial agents and antiviral agents, there's going to be a relationship. Historically, influenza has been rather difficult to tease out PKPD relationships. And uh, we do believe that there's enough evidence to suggest that the dose of 600 milligrams is more likely to give more benefit to more people. That's basically the conclusion of that analysis. And because it was not associated with any, uh, uh, any adverse impact related to the dose being different from the lower doses, uh, that's what we've suggested as being the marketed dose in the US. So there's not increased toxicity? Correct. So, so let me just jump on that as well, because as we were all worried about highly pathogenic avian influenza, and you had to be worried about it in Los Angeles with LAX and people coming from Southeast Asia, 
uh, Fred Hayden um, and uh, Jeremy Farrar did a study with folks infected with H5N1 and tried to determine whether or not doubling the dose of ozeltamivir improved outcome in those patients. And it may have had a slight benefit on mortality, but the results were not striking. And the question would be, did they start it early enough? Uh, did they get it to the right patient populations? Were the patients malnourished? All of the standard questions that you would worry about. But it really does beg the question of, what do we do as we go down this road and anticipate another pandemic? We're not gonna see as mild a pandemic as 2009 H1N1 with the next one. We have to be worried about a more severe pandemic. And so many eggheads like Michael and me talk about, <laughs> you know, can we use combination therapy and are we gonna have drugs that have different mechanisms of action? We don't now, but we hope we do in the future. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sherry. Hi, Sherry Crow from Pharmathene. I'm curious, you alluded to the fact that in 2009, a pandemic setting, you would go to multiple um, pharmacies to get the prescription filled, and one of the issues was supply. And so I'm curious, in terms of supply, how it would be presented and packaged, how it would be stored, and, and if you're talking about a pandemic or a stockpile situation, um, how long is the shelf life and how often would it need to be replaced? So let me clarify what I said about my own family having to go to three different pharmacies. That was seasonal influenza. That wasn't even pandemic influenza. They just ran out of drug. And so um, I do think that there are issues of keeping drug in the supply chain for major pharmacies. And, and this was three major pharmacies that have a presence a good across, distribution yeah, mechanism. across North America. Um, the bigger question is, is what about stockpiling these drugs? Uh, fortunately, the neuraminidase inhibitors that we have have a, a shelf life of a brick. So it's a long shelf life. They have to be reconstituted. They have to be repackaged along the way because the packaging doesn't last, but they do have a shelf life that's long. You know, the argument that you hear from some people is, well, the, the strain of flu is going to change and we're going to get resistance. Well, you know, I'm part of a group that's looking at global surveillance for influenza resistance to the licensed uh, neuraminidase. And the only change that we've seen in the appearance of resistance has been in very, very young children children less than a year of age, and it's simply because they've got a higher load of virus, and selective pressure will select out the resistant strain. But in adults who are expo exposed to any of these medications, the probability of resistance is no more than 2.5%. And a one-time injectable, more importantly to this discussion, a one-time injectable will li likely lessen the selective pressure to pull out a resistant virus simply because you've given the clinically effective dose in one shot, you don't have to worry about the nadirs that occur between doses of the other uh, neuraminidase inhibitors. So that is, a, again, a meritorious study to conduct to see whether or not resistance emergence will uh, be any different. So Another question. So, uh, so let me clarify what doses were used in the Japanese study. Uh, so the, the doses used in the studies that are being presented at this meeting were 150 milligrams and 300 milligrams. So where are the studies on the 600? Uh, there have been several studies. They're not being presented in this, in this analysis, but uh, there were subsequent studies in Japan that used 600 milligrams as a single dose, and uh, there were studies in the United States in a uh, more severely ill and in, and in other countries uh, that used uh, the 600 milligram dose in a more severely ill population. How many patients with the 600? Uh, several hundred. The total number of patients that we've got in the clinical database is 2,700. But you have several hundred at the 600 milligram dose. Yeah, so exactly, yeah. Precisely so, what data was being presented here that is, has not been presented anywhere else? Rich's paper has never been presented before. Yeah, these data, the data that are going to be presented on Monday morning have never been presented before, and that's the person by person or individual patient meta-analysis that is the basis for um, submission to the Food and Drug Administration, one of the legs of the stool for the Food that's and Drug Administration. That's the supporting Correct. data. That's, and that is 150 and 300 milligram doses. That's correct. 427 confirmed patients with influenza. So could you address the fact that you, on the um, unadjudicated 
you met the primary endpoint in that analysis, but you failed in the in the adjudicated. Mm -hmm. And could you sort of, Dr. Whitley, address that? Sure. So um, something that we sort of alluded to, but uh, needs a little more explanation, is that studies have been done with this drug, uh, given both by intramuscular injection as a single shot, and also by intravenous infusion as a short infusion. Uh, it hurts to get an intramuscular injection. Actually, it hurts a fair bit with this drug to get an intramuscular injection, and um, you know we had to have our, our study subjects uh, be kept in the clinic. Um, so that, you know, lie flat because you, if you stand up after an IM injection like that and feel faint, that's probably a bad thing. So we learnt during the development program that that probably wasn't going to be a viable way of giving paramivir. Uh, it so happens uh, that the exposure to the drug, in other words, the blood levels that you get after an IM shot, uh, are exactly the same as the exposure levels after an IV infusion. And that poster, with that data, uh, we're presenting this afternoon in the poster session. So uh, the, the curves are so close, you can't distinguish them. So the area under the curve of nanogram hours per mil, you know, uh, exposure of drug, it's, it's identical. And we formally proved that across a broad dose range, including the uh, proposed license dose of 600 milligrams, uh, that uh, it's bioequivalent IV and IM. What that meant for the file is that all of the safety data and all of the efficacy data for both routes of administration could support either route of administration being the labelled route. Uh, because it hurts a lot less to get an IV infusion compared to an IM shot of paramivir, that's what we'll be marketing assuming the FDA approves the drug. So, um, and just to reiterate again, uh, the the analysis that we did looking at uh, what's the maximum likelihood of benefiting from the drug related to the dose across all of these studies taught us that 600 milligrams uh, was well supported by the evidence. So we, have a, uh, we believe we have ample safety data, ample efficacy data, and a PKPD model that all support using 600 milligrams IV single dose paramivir as the labeled dose. Ultimately, that's a regulatory dialogue and decision. And we haven't finished that process yet, but that was our uh, that was our application. So let me ask the question that the average patient is going to ask: Where does the shot go? So um, the physician has a choice: oh. of putting a little butterfly needle in a vein on the back of the hand, uh, uh, if necessary, a slightly larger IV cannula in any other accessible vein and infusing the drug over 15 to 30 minutes. So, so it's, it's relatively can, easy. It's relatively easy for any physician's office that can handle short IV infusions. Another question from, this time, from the Twitterverse. Yes, we have one question that's come in from the chat room. It's from um, Mr. Yon. He asks, I just got here. He came in late to the session. I was wondering when the drug will be available in the US or when you think it might be available. Uh, so the, uh, in order to market a drug, it has to be approved by the Food and Drug Administration. So uh, I mentioned uh, earlier that uh, the date set under the regulations um, for a decision from the Food and Drug Administration on Paramivir uh, is the 23rd of December. It's quite possible that the FDA will finish their review and tell us their decision prior to that. And if that decision is favourable, then uh, we're in a position to make the drug available pretty quickly after approval. So you know, we're clearly hopeful that that'll be the case. Um, those of you who follow the Biochrist press releases, and maybe there are one or two of you who do that, uh, will know that uh, our uh, finish and fill and finish contract manufacturer, in other words, somebody has to take the active drug, dissolve it in the formulation, put that in as a sterile formulation in glass vials, and put rubber stoppers in the vials. Not a complicated thing to do, and uh, this is a very stable drug at room temperature, which we didn't get around to answering that question, but it has a shelf life of uh, five years, and the stability profile is very good. So um, that contract manufacturer is currently dealing with uh, issues they have to fix in their plant that have nothing to do in particular with paramivir. So that has to get resolved, and the plant has to get inspected and pass an inspection by the FDA. Uh, in order for the FDA to issue their ruling. So that's, you know, 
uh, we're very confident that that will happen. I can't tell you whether that'll happen in the next few weeks or the next few months. I'm 100% ex you know, confident that those issues will get resolved because contract manufacturers will go out of business unless they fix those issues. So uh, um, you know, that's, they're the remaining steps uh, before we get a ruling from the FDA. Sure, Dr. Whitley, a tag on question. Uh, for immunocompromised patients, uh, I know we said that 600 milligrams seem to be okay, but for a sick immunocompromised patient, do you think there's any value in going to 1,200 or pushing doses? You may not want to answer that. You may want to defer, but you probably know. know the data better than I. You know, it's, it's uh, intuitive on the part of physicians, and we all make judgments depending upon the degree of immunosuppression and how the patient fares. Um, I don't know whether there's any safety data at 1,200 at all that, you know, is available. Um, so as part of uh, uh, the development of any small molecule drug, so you know, drugs come in different molecular forms. There are small molecule drugs which you would traditionally think of as a pill, uh, and you know, intravenous antibiotics are you, you know, in that class. Then there are protein drugs, and uh, you know, people are working on RNA drugs. So there are different molecular forms of drugs. For small molecule drugs, um, it was discovered some years ago that uh, some, of, some drugs uh, can affect the electrical conductivity in the heart. Uh, so as part of the development program, you give a big dose of the drug, which you don't intend to market. So in other words, it's, it's a worst case scenario dose you of the drug. You see whether or not there's going to be any cardiac exactly. issues. Exactly. So that's called a thorough QTC study. And as part of the development of Paramavir, we did a thorough QTC study at 1200 milligrams. It was negative, of course. Uh, that was a small study. So there's a small amount of experience giving 1,200 milligrams to healthy subjects, but we've never studied that dose in influenza. I would add one other point, and that is there's no evidence of synergy if you take two neuraminidase inhibitors and put them together. That's a good, that's a very good point to bring out. I, I wish I could say that there was. Yeah, that would be exciting if true. Another question, please. Yes, hi, Nathan Seppa, Science News. I have a couple of questions on how this plays out. The last time I got sick and called my doctor, they said, well, we, we can fit you in Tuesday. Uh, you know, I, I think, what about the possibility of urgent care or minute clinics, uh, walk-in clinics having this? And I wonder if that's a, a, a key way to do it. And the other thing being, though, how many of those have IV capabilities? How much more likely would it be to get an IM shot? I don't know how bad this IM shot is, but it sounds nasty. But I, I wouldn't want to spend 30 minutes on an, an IV if I run to a minute clinic. Uh, and I also don't understand how the IV thing would work in a nursing home if you had a lot of people. Those are three good, good comments and questions. Gentlemen, how do you want to address those? I don't work in any of those settings, so I'm probably not the best person to respond. I think a lot of this is going to be working out the bugs as uh, the drug is used in the real world. No, and, and I think it's always real world issues, and I think if there is a large pandemic, I think public health officials are going to begin to look at urgent care clinics and looking at the trade-offs between the IM shot versus the IV because time, time is, is precious. The surgeons always say time is tissue, but here it's, you know, how many people can you move through? Bill, do you want to comment or? Well, um, we won't be, and we won't be able to recommend or promote intramuscular injections with Paramavir because the application is for intravenous Paramavir infusions. That's right. So, uh, you know, with regard to the evidence, the body of evidence about IM shots, it really hurts to get an IM shot. And especially if it's a low pH formulation, which this happens to be. So um, we won't be promoting it. It won't be on the label. Uh, the instructions in the label will be IV use. Okay, another question. So I'm wondering about the Japanese patients still. We found in other areas that um, drugs that work in Caucasians don't necessarily work in Japanese or don't work at the same um, dosing. So, you're use so your pivotal data is, have you done any kind of studies that show that that actually, there's not a, a difference there? A racial difference? So there the are, universality of the mm -hmm. drug. It's a very good question and it's a valid question to ask and uh, at its core what you're wondering about are a couple different things. One is, is the metabolism of the drug different in different ethnic groups? 
And another one is, is the disease different in different ethnic groups because of differences in immunity that are coded by HLA genes or whatever. So I think that the answer to the question can be driven by answering metabolism questions and by answering questions about uh, the severity of the illness, the pattern of the illness and the outcomes uh, in the Japanese population in this case and the Caucasian population. They're the two populations we have. Uh, so let's take the second question first. Uh, uh, we did in, in, indeed do those types of analyses and looked at the severity of illness. Uh, there's a severity of illness score that you collect in these studies. And we look at the outcomes and the pace of resolution of viral shedding, for example, in the placebo groups. So we, you know, we're fortunate because we have placebo groups in both of these populations. So all of that looks very similar. We can't distinguish uh, influenza in Japanese patients in our studies from influenza in Caucasian patients in our studies. So that's reassuring. So the disease doesn't look any different. And the immune responses uh, that ultimately cure acute viral infections uh, you know, by, uh, by implication aren't different in the two populations. Um, Paramavir is not metabolized. It's a very simple drug uh, and excre it's excreted through renal excretion undergoing no modification. And that's true in, doesn't matter what your ethnic group is. So I think that on those grounds, um, uh, we're pretty confident that the Japanese data is 100% relevant and reliable uh, with regard to being viewed as a pivotal study. And it's not, it's not weight based at all? Uh, so at, at this stage in the United States, uh, we don't have uh, the data we need for a pediatric application. Uh, we will be starting a pediatric study. Uh, and we hope that if that's successful, we'll be able to put in a supplementary NDA uh, for use in pediatrics. It is approved in Japan uh, for use in, in children, and in children, uh, the, uh, as you might expect, uh, the dosing is weight-based. Uh, but in adults, it'll be a, a standard dose. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? If not, I'd like to thank the audience for their participation in this edition of ASM Live. Please join us again, or listen for me, Michael Schmidt, when I join my colleagues Mozilio Schechter from Small Things, Consist Small Things Considered, Michelle Swanson from the University of Michigan, or Vince Racaniello from Columbia University when we all get together for TWIM, this week in microbiology, the podcast that explores the unseen life on our planet. Thank you, everybody. Once you're in the BSL-4 space, the only way you can get out is to go through a chemical shock. It's an unusual room. Never seen anything like this. Anybody who has access to this facility first has to go through an iris scan. So the HEPA filters filter the air coming out of the facility and that will remove bacteria, viruses, anything that might constitute any kind of risk, right? Remember this building is, is basically a second building inside the main building.